Hello, driver's ed class. All right. Uh, coming to you this morning with a little bit of information about chapter four, which is traffic laws. So we are finally done talking about all of the stuff about how do you get a license and what are the different phases of licensure, uh, the permit phase, the initial driver's license, all of those steps of the graduated driver's license program, all the requirements for, uh, for getting a license, uh, the, the parts of driver's ed class. We're done talking about that stuff. We may review it and revisit it just to make sure you know the information. But now, today, we're going to finally start talking about the laws. When you're out there driving, what are the things that you need to know? Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. And there is a lot to learn. So some of the stuff you're already going to know, some of this stuff, a lot of this stuff will probably be brand new to you. So let's go ahead and jump right in and see what we can learn today about the Illinois rules of the road. Wow, that's a lot of text on this slide. Okay, well, what is the importance of traffic laws? Traffic laws are designed to protect people. Um, there haven't always been traffic laws, but what we found out was that people don't always make good decisions. And so we need laws to protect people because if people are just left to uh, make up their own mind about what's safe, not everybody makes good choices. And you guys know that, right? I mean, you know that. You know the people that uh, are in your class that don't always make safe choices. Maybe you're one of those people. Well, here's the deal. When you are driving an automobile, that is not the time to be taking chances because it's not just you that you're taking chances with, it's the other people that you're sharing the roads with. So it is important to obey traffic laws to keep us safe. It's also important to obey the orders of a police officer, firefighter, highway authority official, uniformed adult, school crossing guard, um, you know, all of these people that help control traffic in situations like, like um, uh, an intersection obstruction and you got a police officer there directing traffic around an accident or a fighter fighter directing traffic around a house fire. Um, and you know, the, the firefighters are using part of the street and they've got somebody out there directing traffic around that, you know, all of these things, it's important to obey the, the traffic, uh, control people. We'll just say, cause some of them are police officers, some of them are firefighters, et cetera. Distracted driving, this is a huge problem in today's world, and it's not just a problem of young people. I am not here to tell you that this is only teenagers doing this. Far from it, okay? I see, I see lots of adults driving down the road just staring at their phone. Some people don't even try to hide it. They're just literally holding their phone here, and they're driving with one hand, and they're looking straight at their phone. Other people are doing this whole thing. Like, like everybody on the road doesn't know exactly what they're doing, right? Okay, distracted driving. I'm, I'm pointing out cell phones because that's the most prevalent distraction, but that's not the only thing that distracts us from driving, okay? So that's important to realize. But Illinois law prohibits the use of handheld cell phones, texting, or other electronic communications while operating a motor vehicle. Hands-free devices or Bluetooth technology is allowed for persons ages 19 and older. So if it goes through your, your car stereo, that's fine. If you got one of the little ear things, you know, the Bluetooth earbuds or whatever, that's fine. As long as it's a single one, it cannot be one in both ears. That's not okay. Using just the speaker phone on your phone and setting it down is not considered hands-free. It took up too much space to put it on this slide, but if you don't believe me, go look in the rules of the road book yourself. Putting your phone on speaker phone does not count as hands-free. Now you might say, but Mr. Smith, I can put it on speaker phone. I can set it on my console. I'm not holding it. The police don't care. The law doesn't care. For whatever reason, they've decided that that doesn't count, and those are the rules that we've got to abide by. Uh, the only time Illinois drivers can use a cell phone that is not hands-free is in an emergency situation. 
So if it's an emergency situation and you need to call 911 without pulling over, so whatever that reason might be, maybe you've got some really suspicious car that just keeps following you. Maybe you've got a car that is pulling you over and you're not convinced it's a police officer for whatever reason. You can call 911 and drive slowly, um, you know, do not exceed the speed limit, and you can talk to 911 um, and they will direct you about what to do. Uh, you can also be parked on the shoulder of a roadway, and then you can use a phone not hands-free. You can text, you can make a call. Um, you know, I suppose you could play a game, but on the side of the road, really just go home and play the game. Um, while stopped due to normal traffic being obstructed and the vehicle is in neutral or park. Okay, so <clears throat> if there's some obstruction to traffic, this does not mean you pull up to a red light and, you know, you're like, oh, well, the light's going to be red for like 20 seconds. I'm going to throw my car in park and I'm going to start playing, you know, Clash of Clans or something. No, that's not what that means. All right. That means that normal traffic is obstructed. Uh, you know, maybe there's a freight train and you can tell this thing's going to be a few minutes. Right. OK, that's what we're talking about here. Drivers who are in a crash resulting from distracted driving may face criminal penalties and incarceration. That means you go to jail. That's what that means. The safety belt law. Holy cow, am I glad that they changed this a few years back. You guys would not have wanted to memorize the safety belt law 10 years ago. It was ridiculous. Now it's super easy. If you're in a car and that car is moving, you have to be buckled up. That's it. That's the rule. OK, and then there's some special rules if you're eight and under. OK, you know, you got to be in, in special car seats. And I think I even talk about that a little bit on the next slide. The old rules were super complicated. If the driver was 16 and the passenger was 18 or older than if they were in the back seat, they didn't have to be buckled up. But if the driver was uh, 18 and the passenger was 16 and they were in the back seat, then they had to be buckled up and yada, 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 yada. It was really confusing. OK, now it's super simple. If you're in a car that's on an Illinois roadway, you've got to be buckled up. There you go. Uh, now, some of you have little brothers and sisters that fall into this category. They're under the age of eight. They have to be in a child um, restraint, some type of special seat. Uh, probably the best thing to do is just ask your parents because they, I would assume, know what the correct seat is. But having said that, I see a lot of kids not in the correct seat. Okay, so if they're under the age of two, they're supposed to be in a rear facing seat with a five point harness. If they're between two and four, they're supposed to be in a front facing seat with a five point harness. If they're between the ages of four and eight, they're supposed to be in a booster seat, which is just a little guy that gets you up so the shoulder belt um, crosses your shoulder in the correct spot. Once they reach the age of eight, or if they are at least 40 pounds, or if they are at least 40 inches, and they, um, what's the rest of the rule? And the, the belt would actually hit them in the proper spot. Then they don't have to be in the booster seat. That's that's the rule here. Oh, my, oh man, I was off on my weights. That weight thing is for the age two one. Dang it. Um, yeah, so rear facing until age two, unless they're greater than 40 pounds or greater than 40 inches. Then they can flip around the front facing. Uh, let me tell you, man, that's a tough rule right there. I mean, it's one that needs to be followed, but, um, you know, a 38 pound kid rear facing, that's not a lot of leg room. But, it's the safest way to do it, okay? Then once they hit 40 pounds or 40 inches or age two, they can flip around front-facing five-point harness until the age of four, and then a booster until the age of eight, um, or if they're tall enough for shoulder belt to fit properly. All right, so enough about seat belts. Wear them. They save lives. That's all there is to it. You got, if you have a seat belt on and you're in a crash, yeah, your chances of surviving are 50% greater than if you don't have a seat belt on. I don't want to hear about, yeah, but what if we go underwater? Yeah, but what if the car catches on fire? All right, two things about that. Number one, less than half of 1% of all crashes involve fire or the car being submerged. That's one out of 200 crashes. So we're talking about a really small number. 
And two, if I'm going to be in a crash that involves fire or involves water, I darn well want to be buckled up when that crash happens. Because if I'm not buckled up, my chances of being conscious and getting myself out of that situation are just about zero. So, yeah, zip it and wear a seatbelt. That's all there is to it. Um, basic speed law. So the basic speed law says you may drive at the maximum allowable speed only under safe conditions. What does that mean? That means if the speed limit is 70 miles an hour on the interstate and it's snowing like Christmas at the North Pole, you can't drive 70. If you get pulled over, you're going to get a ticket. And the cop's going to say, what are you, nuts? And you're going to say, but the speed limit's 70. And the cop's going to say, you're a moron. You can't drive 70 in the middle of a snowstorm, okay? That's the basic speed law. So doesn't matter what the speed limit is, you cannot exceed whatever speed is safe for the current conditions. So that could be adverse weather like crazy fog, uh, super heavy thunderstorm, snow, ice, whatever it is. Uh, traffic congestion. It's simply just really heavy traffic. Probably not going to happen in Staunton, but you go down to St. Louis and it will. So if you got really heavy traffic, you can't be zipping around at 70 miles an hour. Or just simply poor road conditions. Uh, maybe you're out in an unmarked rural area, which you're about to learn is a speed limit of 55, and you're out in this unmarked rural area, and it's got tons of loose gravel. Don't drive 55. You're going to wreck. Okay? So, yeah, basic speed law. Don't exceed the speed that's safe for the conditions. What are the speed limits? Well, on the interstate, the speed limit is 70 miles per hour. On four-lane highways, speed limit is 65 miles per hour, unless otherwise marked. And that little disclaimer goes along with every single one of these. There are places on the interstate where the speed limit is less than 70. There are places on four-lane highways where the speed limit is less than 65. Uh, what's the difference between an interstate and a four-lane highway? Well, one's called an interstate and one's called a four-lane highway. There's not a lot of difference other than interstates never have cross traffic, never have cross traffic on an interstate. Four lane highways can have cross traffic where you have streets that intersect them and go across them. Okay, so that's the difference. Four lane highways don't have on ramps and exit ramps. Interstates do. <clears throat> Highways in rural areas, 55 miles per hour, unless otherwise marked. City and town areas, 30 miles per hour, unless otherwise marked. Alleys, 15 miles per hour. I've never seen an alley marked one way or the other, but it's 15 miles an hour. School zone, 20 miles per hour on school days between 7 a.m. and 4 p.m. when children are present. There's your speed limits. There's going to be a question coming up. All right. What about construction zones? Construction zones. What is your job in a construction zone? Well, your job in a construction zone is to slow down, yield to authorized vehicles, change your lane away from where the workers are when possible. So when possible, you need to move away from the workers so that you don't have a chance of hitting them and proceed with caution. Most construction zones will have a posted speed limit. Some construction zones, if it's a temporary, I know all construction zones are temporary, but you know, if they're just laying new pavement and they're not you know, fixing a bridge or something, then that's a much more temporary construction zone. And they may not have a posted speed limit, but they'll have one of the people there with the slow stop, slow stop, one of those kind of deals. And so there won't be a posted speed limit, but you just need to go nice and slow. I mean, we're talking, you know, 20, 25, 30 miles an hour, something like that. Motorists must obey the posted construction zone speed limit 24 hours a day, seven days a week, regardless of the presence of workers. I'm not, I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm not 100% sure why this is the way it is. Um, but it is, so we got to follow it. And 
it's kind of annoying when you're driving through one of these construction zones at 10 p.m. and there's not a single worker around and the road looks pretty safe and you're thinking, man, this is an interstate. I could easily be doing 70 instead of 45, but all right, I guess I got to go 45. I'm not sure the logic behind this. There, There's probably a good reason why you have to follow the construction zone speed limit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know what it is, but you got to do it. Um, that's the same slide, only no cell phones. Emergency maintenance vehicle. Why? Here we go. All right. Oh, uh, also in construction zones, no cell phones. I got a little bit of a typo here. Uh, when you're in a construction zone, you cannot be using your cell phone. Um, okay, so let's ignore that slide. I don't even think it's supposed to be in there. All right, here we go. Uh, what about when you are being approached by an emergency vehicle? So we're going to talk about two different scenarios. One, you're driving along and here comes a police officer towards you with their lights on. What are you supposed to do? Um, well, what you're supposed to do is pull over to the side of the road, the right side of the road. Pull over the side of the road. Uh, stop if possible. Do not block a driveway or intersection. The police car will go on by uh, chasing down some bad guy, and then you can signal and pull back into the road. That's what you're supposed to do. Okay, it doesn't matter if it's a police car or an ambulance. Um, basically, any emergency vehicle, a fire truck, rescue squad, any of that kind of stuff. <clears throat> school zones. Remember, school zones are 20 miles per hour. We talked about that just a second ago. And also, you are required to stop and yield to children and adults in the crosswalk area. So if they're getting even close to the crosswalk, you have to stop and yield in a school zone. Pedestrians have the right of way in crosswalks. And that's whether it's a school zone or not. But in school zones especially, even if that pedestrian is just getting close to the crosswalk area, you have to stop and let them go. Funeral processions. This is a major pet peeve of mine, all right? People, quit breaking the, this rule and quit breaking this, this etiquette. Um, so what does the rule say? Yield the right of way to all vehicles in the procession. So what does that mean? Well, if you come up to a four-way stop, and you're stopped and here comes a funeral procession, they all get to go through the stop sign. You don't take your normal turns. It's not like one car from the funeral goes and then one car goes this way and one car from the funeral goes and one car goes, that's not the way it works. You stop, the entire funeral procession goes on by. That's the way that works. Um, you are prohibited from joining a funeral procession or attempting to pass any vehicle in a funeral procession. You're prohibited from doing that. What you're not technically prohibited from doing is if a funeral procession is coming towards you and you're going this way, you're not technically prohibited from continuing to drive. But common etiquette and courtesy is to pull over and show your respect to the family that's mourning the loss of a loved one. Pull over to the side of the road, let that funeral procession pass. This used to be absolute, everybody did it. And as times have, have gone on, less and less people are doing this. And it drives me crazy. Pull over, show your respect, let the funeral procession pass. It's You're talking about literally a minute out of your life. Right of way, a driver. Okay, so right of way situations. We're getting ready to talk about a bunch of these here. Um, let me pause this for just. Okay, we're going to talk about right of way situations. We're not going to get through all of them today because there's a lot of them. But a right of way situation is who gets to go first in, in certain circumstances. And so we're going to talk about many of those. You as a driver must yield the right of way to other drivers, bicyclists, or pedestrians in a variety of situations. So let's talk about some of those. You are allowed to, um, 
to make a right turn on a red light, but you first have to yield the right of way to anybody going the other direction. Okay, so you have to yield the right of way when making a right turn on a red light after a complete stop. So what does that mean? Well, let's talk about it. So here we are. Let's say that this direction of travel right here has a red light. Okay, so that's a red traffic light, not a stop sign. And, you know, I'm coming up to the intersection here and I'm driving a blue Jeep and I want to turn right. Here's my little right turn signal. See that flashing light? So what this says is that I have to yield the right of way to anybody coming this direction. Okay, so here's a car headed this direction. Why do I have to yield the right of way to them? Well, if I've got a red light, what color light do they have? If you said green, you're absolutely right. So I cannot make my right turn until after they go through. Once this car here makes it through the intersection, then I can make my right turn. Okay, that's what this law says. Let's see, if I go to the next slide, will this go away? No. <laughs> All right, next scenario. You have to yield the right of way after coming to a complete stop at an intersection where there is a stop sign or flashing red signal. If there is no stop line, stop before the crosswalk. If there is no crosswalk or stop line, stop at a place where all approaching traffic can be seen. We got three different scenarios there, so let's break it down. So this says that, well, let me go back for just a second. And, um, so after coming to a complete stop where there is a stop sign or flashing red signal. So we're talking about when we have a stop sign. And specifically, we're just, we're just talking about where we have to stop, basically, is what we're talking about here. So this um, rule is telling us where we have to stop. So the first thing is we know that we have a stop sign. So this is not a traffic light this time. This is a stop sign. So I'm going to draw a little signpost. So if we have a stop sign, this is giving us three different possible scenarios here. One scenario is where do we stop if we have one of these thick white lines painted? Well, if we have one of those thick light white lines painted, that means we have to stop before our front bumper gets to that line. Okay, we have to stop before that front bumper gets to that line. Well, what if, let's head over here to this side of the intersection. What if, let's just pretend that this is not here. Okay, this is not here. What if instead of having a thick white line there, what if there is a pedestrian crosswalk? So there's a spot for pedestrians to cross the street here. So no stop line, but there is a pedestrian crosswalk. Well, the rule says you got to stop before your front bumper gets to that pedestrian crosswalk. All right. What if there is neither? What if there's no stop line? or a crosswalk, then where do you have to stop? Well, if we've got a stop sign, the rule says you got to stop at a point where oncoming traffic may be seen. That's a little confusing. Here's what I say. If you draw an imaginary line from corner to corner, okay, we've got this corner right here, and we've got this corner right here behind all my other scribbles. If you draw an imaginary line between those two corners, you have to stop before your front bumper gets to that line. And you can almost always see oncoming traffic from that spot. If you can't see, if you stop there and you can't see, creep forward slowly after you make your complete stop. Creep forward slowly until you can see to make sure it's clear. So those are the three scenarios. At a stop sign, if there are no markings at all, stop before you enter the intersection and then creep forward if you need to. If there's no stop line but there is a crosswalk, stop before the crosswalk. 
if there is a stop line, stop before the stop line. Now, sometimes there will be a stop line and a crosswalk. Sometimes there's a stop line and a crosswalk. Does that mean you need to stop twice? No. You stop before the stop line and that counts. Okay. And you don't go unless the crosswalk is clear and it's your turn. All right. I hope that makes sense. So our next right-of-way situation, a driver must yield the right-of-way when making a left turn on a red light after a stop from a one-way street to another one-way street when traffic is moving to the left. So what does that mean? Well, you're not going to run into this situation in Staunton or Livingston or New Douglas or Williamson, um, but you very well will run into this situation in St. Louis. So let's go ahead a slide here. And we've got a bit of a different diagram because our other diagram doesn't work with this. But here's the scenario. So we've got two one-way streets. Here's a one-way street where traffic is moving uh, up in this diagram. And here's a one-way street where traffic is all, all three lanes are moving in that direction. So if you're this car right here, if you're this car that has the big turn arrow, and you pull up and the light is red. Can you turn left on this red light? And the answer is yes, once you yield the right of way to this car right here. Okay, so once this car makes it on through the intersection and they find themselves over here, then you can proceed to turn assuming that there are no other cars coming. And you got to turn into this nearest lane right here. Okay, that's the only time you can turn left on a red. Any other time, you cannot turn left on a red. All right, and then this one is the one that you guys have to know. I mean, you really got to know all of these, but this is the one that you have to know like the back of your hand because when you approach an intersection, and it's a four-way stop intersection, which are all over the place. You got them all over Staunton. When you approach a four-way stop intersection, you've got to know when it's your turn to go. You have to know what the rules are. So here's what the rule says. First one to get there is the first one to go, and you follow that order. So it's first come, first serve. First driver to stop should be the first to go. The next driver that stopped will be the next to go. And we're talking about actually making it to the intersection. So if there's three cars in line on one side of the intersection and nobody else is at the intersection, it's not like those three cars have all reserved their spot already and they're all three going to get to go. It's, it's talking about who makes it up to the actual intersection. So if you're the third car back and while you're there, someone pulls up to the stop line on another side of the intersection, well, they are going to get to go before you do, okay? That might be a little confusing for me just uh, describing it here, but I'll try to show you on the next slide. All right, when two vehicles on different roadways are, arrive at a four-way stop intersection at the same time, the vehicle on the left should yield to the vehicle on the right. Okay, so we got two things there that we need to talk about. So let's talk about this one first. I'm going to pause this real quick and set up a scenario, draw some things out. Okay. So I've got this diagram drawn here, and this is our four-way stop intersection. We can tell that because all four directions of travel have the white stop line painted on the pavement. All right, and I tried to draw this to show that A is already at the stop line and B is right behind A. So these two cars have already stopped. C is approaching the stop line, and D is also approaching the stop line. Now, C is going to get there a little bit before D, and D will arrive just after that. Um, so, <clears throat> who gets to go first in this situation? Well, the car that gets there first goes first. So, since A is the first one, they get to go first. So, they're the ones that are going to get to go first. And let's just say in this situation, everybody's traveling straight. So A gets to go across the intersection here, 
and A is the first car to go. Boy, that doesn't show up very well in that green, does it? So A is the first car to go. Now, who gets to go second? If you're thinking B because they were stopped behind A, that's that situation I was talking about. B hasn't actually made it up to the stop line yet. So even though they were there before C and D, that doesn't count. It's only talking about getting up to the stop line. So B is not ready yet. So the next car that's going to get to go is going to be car C because they're going to be the next car that arrives. So car A was first. I'm going to redraw this in red so that we can see it. Car A was first and then car C is going to go. And who's next? That's right. Car D will be third. And then the last one to go is car B. So A, C, D, B is our correct order there. A, C, D, B. A, because they're there first. C, because they're going to be the second to arrive. D, because they're the third to arrive. And then B will, will get to go last. Now, if by some chance B gets to the line before D does, then B would get to go. But that's not going to happen because D is going to beat them there. Okay? Not that it's a race. It's not a race. Okay, here is another scenario. The second part of that right-of-way situation was, what if two cars on opposing roadways? So here's one roadway, here's the other roadway. So these are roadways that meet at a 90-degree angle. Um, what if these two cars arrive at the same time? So it's not that one gets there before the other, but they get there at the same time. Then what do you do? If there's a tie, how do you know who goes first? Well, this says that the car on the right gets to go first and the car on the left has to yield. So the tie goes to the driver on the right. Okay, so if you think about yourself sitting in car A, this would be your right side and this would be your left side. If you think about sitting in car B, this would be your left side, and this would be your right side. So if you're in car A, you look and you say, well, B is to my right. If you're in car B, you look and you say, oh, A is to my left, so I must be the one on the right. So in this situation, B would have the right of way, and B is who would get to go first. Okay, I think that's enough for today. We've covered quite a bit of material and we have more right-of-way situations to cover tomorrow. So I hope you learned something, uh, but even if you didn't, just like my prof favorite professor, Dr. Phillips used to say, it's better than a sharp stick in the eye. We'll see you.